This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Well, welcome back to UCSB's Distinguished Lecture Series. We have with us tonight Dan Burnham. Dan has had a very celebrated career. It's wonderful to bring someone in who's run massive organizations and done, done so so effectively um, and has done so with, with a real entrepreneurial gusto and a real entre entrepreneurial spirit. Um, so I'm excited to, to um, have you guys get to know Dan a little bit better. Just as a point of reference, quick background. Dan was, is the retired chairman and CEO of Raytheon. You may have heard of it, small little defense company with a couple hundred thousand employees. Prior to running Raytheon, uh, he also ran another large company, Allied Signal, um, where he was also the, the CEO and chairman. He sits on a number of boards and has sat on a number of boards in his career. First Data, um, Fleet Boston, he's past chairman of a number of different industry groups, which is may not mean a lot to you guys, but in, um, when you start to advance in your career to be named chairman of some of these industry groups that are really counting on you to had their voice heard in Washington and other places. It's very much an, an, an honor, very much a distinguished honor. I'll read a couple of them to you. He was on um, the chairman of the President's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee. He was the past chairman of the Aerospace Industries Association, and he's also been a member of the Business Council. In addition, Dan and his wife have been very, very generous benefactors here at UCSB. They set up the Burnham Engineering and Applied Sciences Scholarship Fund, and they also set up the Burnham Scholars Program. Giving your money is one thing. Writing a check can, can be easy for some people. It's giving your time, I think, that really shows the difference um, in somebody that really cares. Dan has given a tremendous amount of his time to UCSB. Not only is he on our board of trustees and has been for years, he also serves on a variety of different committees, including a specific focus on the technology management program. He's been a real friend of our program through the years. Dan earned his under, undergraduate degree in economics from Xavier University, and he earned his MBA from the University of New Hampshire. He's, he's got honorary degrees, for God's sake. I want an honorary degree. Dan has an, honor, has an honorary degree from Pepperdine and Bentley College. Let's welcome Dan to our class. I think we should stop here. I hope you recorded that. I, I, I want that. I'm going to bring it home. Play it for your kids next time yeah. they give you crap. Right, yeah, right. <laughs> All right, Dan, well, I wanted to, to start out with, um, I love your story. Um, and I love the story that you, know, you, you didn't necessarily think you were going to go to college. You certainly right. had, I, I would say, relatively modest ambitions in the beginning. How did that change? Like, what, was the, what were the events that led you to sit in this chair and have all of this accolades? Um, be, just before I was here, I was with uh, 10 or 12 students, many of whom are here, and uh, a question similar to that was asked, and I gave the answer, and I thought I was quite articulate. It went on for you know, at least four or five minutes, and at the end of it, this woman said, fear. That was the answer. <laughs> it was fear, that that's what drove you. Well, the, uh, it's true, I didn't come, I came from a, uh, a working family in Detroit, and uh, uh, I was working in a factory, a car factory, a truck factory, and uh, I thought well, I was making 350 an hour at that time, it'd be like $25 an hour now, enough I could buy a Corvette, so life was good, right? <laughs> uh, but it was a dehumanizing experience. It was, uh, people didn't treat one another with respect, the bosses looked down on the workers and the workers hated the boss, and I thought, this can't be it. And I thought, well, I guess maybe I ought to go to college. And I came home, said that to my parents, and they said, really? And I said, yeah. We created a few rules. 
She said it has to be a Catholic college. I said it has to be 300 miles away from home, and she didn't argue with me. I thought maybe a little bit of argument would be nice, but she didn't. At least she didn't say 400. So uh, it was, I was sort of propelled to get into education, to get educated out of fear, as the uh, student reminded me earlier, but to sort of build on that, uh, I, as far as I know, I never studied in high school. I was smart enough that I got pretty good grades, but I never studied. And, but when I got to college, the very first day, the dean said, you may, I don't know if they say this anymore, three of you, one of you will graduate in four years. I don't know if you say that around here, but I thought, my it's God. Six, six years here. <laughs> okay. I thought there's a two-thirds chance I'll be thrown out of school. That's how I interpreted <laughs> it, and I'll be back on the assembly line. So I think I'm supposed to study. And uh, so I started to study, and I thought, Okay, I'll do that, and I started to get good grades. And, uh, and then uh, a year goes by, uh, my high school sweetheart, who's been my wife now for 47 years, uh, followed me a year later to school, and her father says to my father, if Dan's grades go down, we'll pull Mary out of school. <laughs> Don't get mad, ladies, that's what he said. So now I was maintaining a 3.9, and so if it goes below that, my girlfriend's gonna leave. So I had to like really work. <laughs> so that's what motivated me. It wasn't anything particularly glorious. It was some combination of fear and I don't know, whatever other words you want to come up with it. But, uh, and that gave me a work ethic that I absolutely had never had before. And, but it also gave me, I think, a sense of confidence that uh, you know, if I decide I can do something, I can do it. Yep, well it obviously worked. Yeah. But, so one of the things, there's a lot of things I like about Dan, but I like your sense of humor and your irreverence. You have been quoted as saying in the past that any IQ over 120 is wasted <laughs> on a CEO. I have to ask well, you about I, that. Well, I, I've said that, but I said it to stir the pot, and not that uh, I, it's literally true. The, the point was that when you're running a major organization, the idea, or, or or it doesn't have to be a major organ, if you're running much of anything, uh, continuing pondering and analyzing and thinking and evaluating and judging and intellectualizing the problem isn't solving the problem. What solves the problem is you know, to listen, get the facts, uh, have your aspirations, have your goals, know what the customer wants, make a decision, and go forward. And don't sit there and wring your hands over it and go, oh God, maybe I shouldn't have done that if I, you know, keep thinking about it, thinking about it. So it was more to say, look, at some point, you gotta make a decision and move on. And taking more time when it doesn't make it better probably makes it worse. Right. I coded all of that in a way that maybe somebody would remember. Right. Where anything over 120 was a waste. I'm glad you said that, because I'm not over 120. So <laughs> like, I've got a shot. Um, so, kind of going back to, your, your story, you, you, you had that epiphany on the assembly line, your girlfriend motivated you, girlfriend slash wife motivated you. So once you, once you got into the workforce, I think it was more than fear um, drove you to, right. to be so successful. I know there was, there, was an, there was a Harvard element at one point. Yeah, with there was, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, at this, I'm at this company now, the second, well, first of all, I was through graduate school, I was in the Army on my way to Vietnam, and President Nixon uh, reduced the number of lieutenants. I was a lieutenant that was going uh, into Vietnam, so all of a sudden I'm on the job market about a year and a half sooner than I thought, which was good news. It also meant I had to get a job. So the first thing was not a career. The first thing was a job. Get money so we had a child and uh, you know, get on with it. First job I hated, but I, but I probably learned something from having a job I hated, which is I'm not gonna continue to have a job I hate. This is, you know, life is too precious. I'm not gonna go home every night miserable. Uh, there's something better than this, and it's not the assembly line. And, uh, but then that problem was solved for me uh, within a year because the company, it was RCA Computer Systems, uh, went, uh, just stopped operating. 10,000 people were thrown out of work, including me, and I heard about it on the radio mm. on a Friday to find out that by Monday, or well, Tuesday or Wednesday, we'd be out of work. By this time, we had two children. And uh, uh, the solution, because uh, our lease was running up too, because it had just been one year, was to move in with my parents in their basement. All of us were delighted with that decision, oh, sure. I can assure you of that. 
So now I had to get a real job, and uh, I decided that uh, because of that first experience of having a job I didn't like, that as terrible as it was, with all the time pressures and money pressures, I'm going to find a job that's going to fit with what I want. And by this time, somehow, I don't know how it creeped up on me. I was starting to get some ambition and some, some goals. And I decided I wanted to use my finance and e economics background not to become a, a CFO, uh, but to learn the language of business so I could get into business, be successful, and end up running something. I didn't know what, but to run something. And I, I went to work for this company where uh, the uh, vice president and controller had an engineering degree and the uh, plant manager had an accounting degree. And I thought that was kind of cool because that showed that they were going to take chances with people. So I end up, I, I go to that company and I'm a financial analyst by this time at the corporate uh, staff. And uh, we hired a lot of guys from Harvard and, uh, and Wharton and uh, uh, MIT. And uh, I, somehow I was in that mix. And I remember, uh, John's heard this story. I remember it like it was yesterday. Uh, I had been at this company maybe now uh, two or three years. I had done some things that I had been promoted and I had some name recognition there. Uh, and I'm walking across the street uh, with uh, uh, two guys who happened to go to Harvard Business School. And uh, the way I know that is because they didn't say that they went to graduate school, they said that they went to the Harvard Business School. You get that? That's like a joke, right? Uh, people who go to Harvard say they, not, they don't say they went to college, they said they went to Harvard. So, in any event, we're walking across the street, and these two guys were talking about how great it is. We were living in Niagara Falls, Buffalo area, which is another story. And uh, they were talking about the great restaurants in the area. I'm thinking, how in the world do they know about the great restaurants? I, we don't have any money to go to restaurants. We barely have enough money. We had one car, and you know, that was it. And I thought, it's because they must be getting paid more than I am because they went to Harvard, and we're doing the exact same work. And somehow, that, this does not speak well of me, because this turned into, this will not stand. <laughs> Someday they're gonna work for me. You know, that's not very uplifting. That doesn't make me a good person. <laughs> but I remember this. Now look, this is uh, f almost 40 years ago. And I could almost replay it word for word for word. I mean, I didn't say this to these guys, by the way. I'm not an idiot. <laughs> and uh, within not very long period of time, uh, that was true. So I, you know, look, I was saying at this group, who knows what sort of gives somebody a spark. And not everybody has to have the same smart spark, and it's certainly not going to come from the same genesis. And, uh, but you have to have something that's going to drive you through the reality of the workplace. And I don't care which workplace it is. It, it's going to be challenging, it's going to be hard, not all of it's pleasant, and you're going to work harder than you've ever imagined you could work if you're expecting really big things. Something has to push you through all that, and it's not the paycheck. In fact, uh, uh, I'll just sort of move off of that thought. Uh, uh, in a couple of years, well, by the time I was maybe 30, I was vice president of this company and uh, making pretty good money, and then uh, we decided to go sell the company. That's a, another long story. And I was one of the three principals that did that, and we got acquired by a big, rich company in New York who asked me to go to work at their corporate staff. And I, I said I don't really want to, and I talked to some guy, and he said, you can't say no, you just have to tell them how much you expect to get paid and make it big enough that they'll say no. So I told them how much I wanted to get paid, and damn if they didn't say okay. <laughs> so I go to New York, I'm making all this money, I have a gorgeous suite of offices, uh, I'm a secretary, I've got all this, and I hated every minute of it because I wasn't doing anything purposeful or valuable. I was you know, writing reports, meeting with the board once in a while, but I wasn't creating value, and I wanted to be in a value creation mode, not in a value monitoring mode. So I called the company that I was with, who was still part of this bigger company, and I called a guy there, and I said, I want to have a job like doing something real, managing a product, being in marketing, 
uh, not in finance because I'd already come through that. I couldn't be an engineer because I'm not an engineer, but give me, you know, I want a real job. And he said, well, there is a job opening. It's called a product manager, but you're paid at least twice as much as that job is going to pay. And you know, I was probably three levels up from there. Product managers don't deal with the board. I was dealing with the board. I said, I'll take it. And I said, okay. That was easy. What was hard was going home and telling my wife. <laughs> <laughs> we probably should have talked about it first, but I didn't. And she said, so let me get this straight. We're living now in New York, which is, we love New York. My office is up in a skyscraper. I had a big, I had all this wonderful stuff, making more money than I ever thought I'd make. And she said, we're going to get less money and we're moving to Niagara Falls? Yep. <laughs> so that was the best sales job I ever did, yeah. I guess. And, well, you're, uh, you're still together, so yeah. you must have done a good job. And I, probably the deeper point there was uh, I wasn't really in it for the money. If I was in it for the money, I would have stayed there. I was in it to, to sort of make a mark uh, and to run something and to have you know, lots of subordinates who I could fire up to get stuff done. And in fact, I take a pay cut, moved to Niagara Falls, spoke to some pretty serious inner drive yep. that I don't know exactly how I got it, but I got it. Yep. Let's uh, get the mics ready because I'll take a student question after this one. So I, I've, heard, I've heard you've been asked before, uh, short circuit, any students asking this, what's your secret of your success? You talked a little bit about fear, but, but, uh, but I think it, obviously it was a lot more than no, that. No, it wasn't really fear. I mean, it was more as, as much a joke as anything else. But well, it was something that changed my life. I mean, uh, uh, there's a certain economic uh, aspect of it, but it wasn't really for the money. It was, uh, I guess, I saw how dehumanizing the workplace can be. It was really quite a, a, a strenuous uh, experience for me to, I gave a, a little story earlier about how a foreman treated me, and I won't repeat it now because we're on camera, but it was, pretty nasty, and, and I thought, you know, this isn't just, this, it should not be like this. And I wanted to be in a situation where I could make a difference for a lot of people by getting them focused on purposeful work for which our customers would pay us and them. And uh, it, exactly how I got there, it's hard to say, but that's where I was, and I, and I probably, had that as my primary motivator for the last 20 years of my career. Yep. Well, I know you've told me in the past that it was a lot of it was hard work, just you know being willing to work harder than the other guy. Oh yeah. Well, absolutely. I just I work all the time, but I didn't see it as a, a downer. I may sound like it, but it wasn't. I'd get up at 5:30. I'd be home by 7:30 or 8 when I, you know, 14 hours later. Uh, when I wasn't traveling, I traveled three or four nights a week. I'd work on Saturday morning and uh, catch up on mail Saturday afternoon. I mean, that's just yep. how it was. Yep. And, uh, but I, I did it because I was making a difference and I cared about it and I loved it. And look, that doesn't make me different from a whole lot of people. I mean, think of all the, I mean, if, without starting off on a political thing, imagine these people making 10 bucks an hour have to have two jobs. But that's hard work. So this was not, this was not tough work. This right. was cool work. Right. Well, you were enjoying what you were doing. Um, take the first question. All right. Well, you guys are, you got to break the ice, guys. First question's the hardest. I'll ask another one, and then you'll be ready, okay? All right. So you, in your, in your career, you hired hundreds and hundreds of people. <laughs> Um, I know that some of your first hires weren't the smoothest. Uh, yeah. What happened with your first one? I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> first of all, before I do that, the first fire, okay? I'm promoted. I'm, I'm, uh, it's very early in my career. And I'm on a team of about six people. I'm one of them. And they make me the boss of the six people. And I knew them all. We were all friends. We were co-workers. And, uh, but I also saw the work ethic and the capability of two of these six people, and it was clear that they were not, not gonna cut it. And I let them go. And I had been to their houses, and they had been to our houses. Their kids knew our kids. And I concluded then that while I will always be friendly, I will never be deep friends with anybody I work with. And it had been almost a few exceptions to that, uh, but you can be friendly without being, you know, compadres. 
because you need to have a, a distance. You have to be objective. And how can you be objective if the guy was just over last night with his wife and his kids? And I mean, it's just really, it was really hard. And I can't say that it, it wasn't easy. It was really hard, uh, but so that, that one. And then, so now I had to hire somebody, right? And I hired, <laughs> hired one guy, I think he was from Cornell. <coughs> I should remember this. And uh, we looked you know, long and hard for him. He came in on a Wednesday, I think it was, and uh, got him all going. You know, I thought this was gonna be great. I go in on Saturday. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There's a note on my desk. Dear Dan, thank you very much. I've decided to leave. <laughs> Didn't say why. I mean, in three days, I mean, I might be a jerk occasionally, but I can't like drive you crazy in three days. So that was my very first hire. And um, you know, <laughs> what can I say? So why did he leave? I, I still don't know. Nobody knows. He just left. <laughs> he just took off. Good job. I have no idea why. <laughs> Well, when you were recruiting and after you got a, some experience under your belt, what were the things you would look for when you sit across from somebody? It's hard in an interview because it's so artificial. Right. It really, really is hard. It's, it's just so hard. I, it was uh, motivation. What drives these people? Is it ego? Is it money? If it's either of those things, I'm not interested. Right. If it's to make a difference, it's to show how good they can be. That's of interest to me. Clearly, what they've accomplished is really important what trials and tribulations they've had if they're a more senior person, how do they deal with conflict, how do they deal with you know, really hard decisions, what things did they do that they wish the hell they had never done, yeah. and what did they learn from that, you know, that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, there's not a lot of science to it. It's, does this feel right? And if, and if you're successful, you know, 70% of the time, you know, you deserve a gold star. Yeah. First question from the class. You talked about the spark, about the Harvard grads getting more money than you. Right. Did that spark stay with you, or did you, yeah. as you progressed through your career, did you have to find new sparks in every little element that you started to explore? I don't know. It just sort of stayed with me. I still have it. I swear to God I do. <laughs> By the way, if there's anybody here from Harvard, I love you. My, my son-in-law was Princeton, MIT, so it's not like, you know, I hate people who went there. That's not, I love this kid. He's wonderful. Uh, but to be more serious, you know, I suppose it's true that there would be a series of sparks, but I think the underlying one was uh, to do well in a large and complex organization because that touches more people than a small one. And, all, and I've been with large organizations always, and that's what I know. I have been involved also on boards and as an investor in small companies, and while I, I think they're terrific. It's not me. I prefer the complexity. Uh, those are the, the problems I like uh, to solve. Uh, I, I will tell you a, a, another story that I don't know if it responds to that question. It's just a story I like to tell. <laughs> uh, Perfect. <laughs> so I shared this with some folks earlier. Uh, this is July 1st, 1990. I'm... I'm uh, I take on the job of running aerospace for Allied Signal, which was about 50,000 people, five billion or more, and I came, as recently ran a chemical company and, uh, and before that in finance. I'm not an engineer, I go there, it's all engineers, the largest supplier to the aviation industry, uh, very complex systems, um, and. Uh, the reason that date sti sticks with me is because on that same day, the new CEO of Allied Signal started. His name was Larry Bossidy. So we started the exact same days in our respective jobs. A week before that, though, uh, uh, Larry was called by the Allied Signal human resource people to say, Larry, there's going to be this guy who we're planning on moving in to run over half the company next week. Would you like us to hold off until you can meet him? He said, no, put him in. If I don't like him, I'll fire him. <laughs> and of course, they couldn't wait to tell me this, right? Because, and I'm going to move from New York to Los Angeles with four kids to go where I, I'm not qualified for it. I'm not an engineer. Everybody there is an engineer. I mean, I'm not technically qualified in that sense. So I'm there, and I have this awareness that uh, this guy who has a reputation for real toughness came out of GE. <laughs> he was vice chair at GE. And uh, so the first time I have a big meeting with him, 
it's only about six or eight weeks into the job, for me to present the strategic plan. I'd only been in this job for weeks. And the strategic plan is a very complicated, copious, uh, uh, you know, product. While I don't write it, I was involved in it and shaped it and, and it was gonna be a plan that I had my fingerprints all over. And I'm gonna now present it to Larry, knowing that this is really, when he said the one week, this is what he meant. <laughs> if he didn't like it, it's like, goodbye Los Angeles, Niagara Falls, I'm coming back home, and how am I gonna explain <laughs> this one, right? So, uh, I'm, dri I'm driving in. The meeting starts at seven o'clock in the morning, which means 6.50, it's another story. But I always got in really early, and uh, uh, so I'm driving in. It's in the convertible, I'll tell you why that's relevant. It's in LA. And uh, I drive in, and I park in a parking space, and I'm getting out of the car, and I smell what I thought was fertilizer, and I thought, geez, did the landscapers have to do that today? This whole place is gonna stink all day when the bosses are in from New York, and you know, all that, but as I'm walking, the smell is staying with me, and I realized that I sat in cat uh, dew <laughs> the entire, for 20 minutes. And of course, it's a convertible, I couldn't smell it, right? <laughs> so now, you know what I smell like, right? So I go in the office, I've got maybe a half hour before this thing starts, and I call my wife, I say, honey, bring me another suit. I can't, I'm uh, driving the carpool, oh God. So <laughs> I go into the bathroom, take off my pants, I get it all wet, I scrub it with soap, I do all this, oh jeez, you know, and I'm starting to get, you know, this is like my big day, right? I should be calm, I should be together, I should be, well, I not only am like, Sweating, I smell like, you know, right? <laughs> this is not a good way to start. So I scrub it and I, I pull it back on and it's soaking wet, it's oh a wool God. suit. You know what that's like to sit in a wet <laughs> wool suit? I walk into the meeting and I think now, how am I gonna handle this? Because I'm, by the way, I'm now maybe five minutes late. It's supposed to start at seven, but that means 10 to seven, My, now it's five of seven, really. And, and the team knew that I was cra crazy about being early, so they wondered, they knew my car was there, like, what happened to Dan? So in I walk, I decided to do it with a certain presence, a certain flair. <laughs> and I said, you know, Larry looks at me, like, like he's kind of irritated, because I'm the last person in. I'm keeping him waiting. That's not a good thing, right? I said, I don't care how the rest of this day goes. It could turn to real, you know, terrible stuff. <laughs> it doesn't matter how terrible the rest of this day goes because it's not gonna be worse than the last half hour I spent sitting in cat <laughs> <laughs> And you know, it kind of broke the ice, but I still sat there for an hour, soaking wet and stinking. Oh. Now what motivated me to do that, right? Because it really changed the dynamics totally absolutely changed the dynamic. He's thinking, well, here's a guy who doesn't get like, you know, catatonic when bad things happen. Mm -hmm. Bad things happen all the time. He dealt with it okay. Not only dealt with it okay, he dealt with it where he got this whole team laughing about it and they're all in the palm of his hand. I don't know how, what motivated me to do that. It just kind of happened. I have, it doesn't relate to your question, but it is a good story. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Um, get, let's get the next question. Do we have it ready? Okay, go ahead. Uh, just given that a lot of leadership organizations, leaders and CEOs have certain maxims or certain sayings that they use to kind of encapsulate their leadership style, uh, what were some of those and how did you see those throughout your uh, company culture? You know, I, I never really had, uh, you know, things you could put on a wall sampler. <laughs> but I, I do have, you know, some principles. The first is that a successful company rests on values. And the values need to be defined, understood, proselytized. And the values don't include making money. They include integrity. They include the customer is the center of the business. They include, you know, all employees are equally valuable and, you know, it, and you know, on and on, that kind of thing. So that people understand that this is a company of values and that they're proselytized. 
uh, number one. Number two, that the customer is, the, is at the center of the organization. Now that may seem obvious. Believe me, it is not obvious in most organizations that you go to. The customer is not clearly at the center of things, in some for sure. What's at the center are the rules and the bureaucracy and the, this is the way we do things around here. The management structure, those are the things at the center of it or here's how we develop products, here's how we get them out to the marketplace. No, the center is the customer. They're the ones who are paying for everything. And we tried to make that crystal clear. We would bring customers in to talk to our factory folks, to talk to our engineers, so that in, in their language they could understand what we were here for. Uh, that all employees are, have to be treated with profound respect. Whether in a union or not in a union, whether they have a PhD or just a, a, a G, GSE. And, and it can't be uh, fake, because the moment you start faking it out that I'm being sincere, <laughs> they know you're not being sincere. So those are uh, is, is some of the uh, principles. Others, though, are that you have to convey complexity down to certain memorable things that, uh, that focus an organization. I gave uh, some, which is the customer is king, but that, that doesn't uh, give you measurable goals that you can follow up and see that you're achieving. I'll give you one story about that. Uh, it, when I uh, joined Raytheon, they had just uh, acquired a number of companies. They had $13.5 billion of debt. They had a triple B uh, negative with a negative outlook bond rating. This is a company that had always had an A or an A with a positive. And to be a triple B negative with a negative outlook means you're right on the edge of junk bond. And if you're junk bond, we couldn't get uh, sufficient financing for our exports, and about 20% of our company was exports. So like nobody seemed to see this as a crisis, but I did. So came in and saw we, we've got to do something about driving cash here. And I mean, that was clear in the first uh, week. So then I go out to our biggest operation. We just acquired it called uh, Hughes. You perhaps have you heard of Hughes Aerospace. And it's headquartered down in uh, El Segundo. I, walk down, I go there for a, uh, a tour. I, this was, I was three weeks into the job and uh, First thing they do is they show me their museum, and then they show me their products, and then they show me some contracts that they're getting, and they show me some, some other things. They're all related to, to technology and engineering, all of which is vitally important. After about three hours, they start to bring out some numbers and revenue and profit and like that, and they're all done with it. And I said, uh, how about cash, cash flow? The president of the company, now uh, this was, how big, uh, Raytheon was 25 billion, this was probably a $10 billion company, organization. So I'm looking at the president of the thing. I said, how's your cash flow? He gives me this querulous look, just, and he looks at the CFO. I said, Dave, you have that? <coughs> Whatever he said, you have that? <laughs> and Dave says, uh, sure. 20 minutes later, he comes back at 20 minutes. Right. And he puts this thing up and it shows his column of numbers and stuff. And I look at it and this is late July, it's a calendar year. He said, now I see your goal for this year and I, that's your forecast there, right? For the, yeah. The, what's the difference there? Am I seeing this right? He said, no, the, the difference is 150 million. He said, you're gonna miss your target by 150 million. Yeah. I look at the president, he goes, <laughs> they, didn't know any, they didn't know anything about it. It was like, I don't know. Wow. Now, you have to, Hughes had been owned by a, 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 a medical uh, trust and the kind of had all the money in the world. These people, their currency of success was the latest contract, their latest invention. That's wonderful. We paid $9 billion for them. You'd think maybe there'd be some cognizance that we have to generate cash, right? So one of the three goals that we created was cash is king. I got over all the hassles of a king or queen and I just said, I'll put up with that, cash is king. I mean, it sounds good and all that. And we talked a lot about it and then we put in measurement systems for it and. And I mean, this was not a simple thing. So, and that was one of three goals. And that, that was one of three for about three years. 
We never had more than that. $25 billion company, three goals, right? So I'm now in a, a one of our uh, operations with a very active union in uh, Rhode Island, and I, I'm going in to, uh, for a tour of the plant. Of course, you walk in, you smell all the fresh paint, and I see all the posters that are going that way, because I'm supposed to go that way where they can show me all these posters. Of course, I go this way, <laughs> and I go up to this woman with a UAW shirt on, and I say, hey, hi, I used to be in the UAW, and what are you doing? I'm an inspector. And, uh, I said, so you know, look, what's going on here? What's important? She said, I'll tell you what's important in this company, cash. We need more cash. Cash is king. She says this to me. This is an hourly person in the union, and uh, so I think I'm three years into the job then. I knew then that I had, that we won. Mm -hmm. I knew then that I had, that we won. And uh, so it was having a s simple message followed up by appropriate systems, appropriate change in all of the processes. We changed everything with clear metrics, clear follow-up, and persistent communication. There you go. <laughs> Three things, 25 billion. All right, we'll get the next question ready. I have a question though first. Um, so I had the honor of being on a board with Dan, smaller company, actually a very small company, um, and I, I really mean it as an honor because I would just go there and I learn so much every time. So we've never talked about this. If you, if you, don't, have a, if you don't have a good story, we'll move on. <laughs> but I'm on a mentor kick, as, as the class knows. Did you either have a, a mentor or a series of mentors, and how did that come about? Or did you find yourself mentoring younger people as you advance in your career? Uh, well, we, we had a formal mentoring system at Allied Signal, and I was a mentor of mentees. Mm -hmm. But I found it unfulfilling mm. because it was a little false. I mean, I'd have lunch with him and her. I mean, over the years, and and you know, hear what's going on in their life and all that stuff. But I didn't see them in situ. They didn't see me really in situ. And it, and by the way, I had mentors growing up who didn't know that they were mentors. Mm -hmm. I would seek them out by observing what they did, both the good and the bad. You, uh, there's a, our kids used to watch this thing, something, something bears, where the bears always did dumb things and you do the opposite of whatever they do. So I'd, I'd also look for a boss who was just a jerk and try to be as opposite from him or her as I could be. So I would be a mentee by watching and observing. But then when I uh, went to Raytheon, I uh, had three, I brought in uh, three different times uh, I forgot what title, like executive director or something like that. A person who reported straight to me, about 30 to 34 or five years old, and their job was you know, sort of be my, if you want to say gopher, but it's, it's not as silly as that sounds. He's not getting me coffee or anything, but uh, to make sure that uh, we take notes in every meeting, that there's follow-up, that he pursues the things that I think are important, uh, but he gets to see a CEO at work, and he was he in those three cases, uh, was with me all, uh, all the time. The first was uh, we had very little diversity in our company. It's a New England company, and it's not like Southern California, let me tell you. And uh, But I was really impressed by this one uh, young black guy, and I brought him in. He's By the way, he sat in on our senior leadership meetings, and n nobody... Uh, said no, but I can tell you, you see all these old white faces and this one young black face there. You think that didn't send messages? And by the way, this guy is now a very senior executive at Raytheon, and he'll be running it maybe someday. And then the next guy was straight from Scotland. I could barely understand a word he said, but he was great. <laughs> and he was filled with fire and vinegar and all that stuff. And so I was a mentor to them, but in a real active way. Right. But. But really, the lesson here is don't wait for somebody to mentor you. You learn from others. And it, you don't have to ask them. Don't ask them. The moment you ask them, I think it makes it like weirdly false. Yeah, I agree. I think it has to be organic. And mm -hmm. the, the, what you described, Alex Signal, it's almost like a forced marriage or yeah, something. Yeah, like, it didn't here's work. your wife. You know, good luck. Like, what? Right, you know? right. Uh, okay, right. maybe it'll work. Probably not. In the back. We had a lecture today uh, on Joseph. Sh 
Schumpter. Uh, he was an Austrian economic mm -hmm. uh, guy. He created Creative Destruction. Mm -hmm. um, and he he uh, uses the entrepreneur spirit. Um, you use words like no ego, values, principle, flair, spark. What is your um, philosophy towards the spirit of entrepreneurship? Um, you can call it the spirit of entrepreneurship if you choose, and this is an entrepreneur-oriented culture here as it should be, but I don't use it that way. It's to me the spirit of leadership, and it's, it's uh, engaging people, get them engaged, get them excited, have an edge. You know, look, we're not here for fun, we're here to get stuff done, and then execute, get it done, get it done, get it done, get it done. So th those four E's have sort of driven me. It's engage, it's excite, it's edge, and it's execute. Now included in that is spark. I mean, engage, excite, uh, spark. Uh, so there. By the way, in terms of uh, creative destruction, uh, uh, second law of thermodynamics. How many here kind of know what it is? I'm not gonna ask. Raise your <laughs> hands, okay. So those of you who really know what it is, don't laugh when I tell you what it is, right? Because this is like my definition, no. It's entropy, which is things left to their own device will fall apart over time. And I absolutely believe that. Energy has to be put into a system, has to be put in to, just to keep it going. But if you want to make a change, it takes a lot of energy. Especially because, and this is Burnham's law of thermodynamics, I mean, <laughs> which I just made up. Things left to their own, bureaucratic things left to their own, structures left to their own will get sclerotic, get complicated, impervious. They'll just lock up over time. The bureaucracies want to protect what's going on, not because they're jerks. They put in these rules so that the last mistake doesn't ever happen again. Right, so you write a rule so that mistake can't happen. Another mistake happens, so you write a rule for that. And you end up with all these rules. So it's this combination of things will fall apart and organizations are really impervious to change. They want to create structures around them. The, uh, when I joined Raytheon, my very first day, I put 108,000 letters, letters, this was in 1998, so sorry, the email systems weren't up to par. <laughs> Besides, the hourly folks didn't have access to that. I put 108,000 letters in front of every single, there's a day I joined. And among the things I said in there is the bureaucracies have to be a bare, bare minimum to keep us together. And the place almost went crazy because this place was bureaucracy central. So I don't know if that's a law or not, but there you go. <laughs> Well, getting back to hiring and what you look for, and, and then with this backdrop of the bureaucracies that you were um, often brought in to try to fix, you like hiring rebels. Can you, can you give us an example right. of like, obviously, what does that mean, but then some examples of people you hire that proved to really be rebels? Right. Well, it was, uh, I'd want to bring in people that would shake up an organization, but to do so in a purposeful way, not just come in and throw bombs around. I right. mean, I don't, I can do that. I don't, you know. <laughs> So uh, uh, I'll, bring, I'll give you an example. Uh, at uh, Allied Signal Aerospace, we were, I may have mentioned, the number one supplier to the aviation industry, in, including the airline industry. But the airlines almost generally hated us. We tend to be late. See, we'd, we'd get spec'd on the aircraft. FDA would spec us on, and once you're on, you're on. So the team wasn't highly motivated to be like warm and comfortable and wonderful with our customers. It's like, yeah, you'll get it. As soon as we can get it to you, we'll get you the product. The customers didn't like that attitude. Our management didn't particularly care if they liked it or not. Well, I came in, I cared a lot about it. I brought uh, the customers in to talk to our people, to tell us what's important. Our senior staff was scared to death. Uh, my God, you bring customers in here, it's, it's really gonna screw things up. So I went and hired the number, the former president of a, of a major airline. Uh, now he was number two at Northwest in charge of all operations at Northwest Airline. That's a big job. I came him, brought him in to be our customer-centric person. He was widely admired in the industry. 
he had bought from us for years. He had run supply chains, he had run the tech ops, he had run customer support, he had run everything. So this is a very senior guy in the airline, airline industry who I came in as the second most senior guy in our organization. He didn't come from our organization, he came, and uh, the senior, uh, all the people who reported to me knew of this guy. He had a worldwide reputation. It was like, oh my God, you got Joe Leonard? Oh, geez. But Joe's great, but he's also tough. He's really going to hold us to high standards. You're damn right he's going to hold us to high standards. And so he brought in, he wasn't the boss of all these people, I was, but he brought in a customer ethic. He brought in a, a whole different way of thinking about things, where they'd all be talking about, well, this is the way we do things here, and this is the way we do things there, and he'd say, well, wait a minute. Uh, who cares? The customers need what they need on time. Right. Now, what are your processes to make sure they get there on time? What? <laughs> so that was, that was a purposeful rebel. Uh, by the way, he stayed there for a long time, a very, very productive guy, became deeply admired. He was not warm and cuddly by any stretch, uh, but he was uh, deeply admired. So that would be, you know, I think a good example of yep. bringing in somebody who thinks differently, but thinks in a way that's congruent with what's necessary. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's well, for example, I'm involved in a small high-tech firm here now. It's a wonderful <coughs> firm. Uh, brilliant technologists. What they don't have is somebody with process discipline of how do you develop things on time, to budget, and so on. So if they bring in somebody like that, it's not a rebel so much, but somebody who thinks differently and responds to a need that they have. Right. Yep. So I think the takeaway, it, it's good to be a rebel, especially if you're a young person, but be a rebel with purpose, sort of have a have a meaningful reason right. to right. rebel as opposed to just rebelling for the hell of it. Well, and you want to carry that on. The fact that you're uh, uh, real smart and have exactly the right words every time and you've got you know, an attitude, that doesn't get you very far. What gets you very far is, is uh, focus, a s positive spirit, an optimistic outlook, and getting stuff done. Yep. Up front. Um, you, talk you talked about um, communi communicating your message down to the employees below you. Did you also have to be uh, pretty technically involved? You seem to be in charge of a lot of technical companies. Uh, if I was involved in the technology of it, we were in deep trouble. <laughs> I, I am not a technologist. Uh, but I, but uh, here was my role in the engineering aspects of things. And we had 40,000 engineers. You can imagine 40,000 engineers. It wasn't that they needed to learn thermodynamics or that they needed to learn engineering. I, they didn't need it. I couldn't teach them even if that was the issue, right? What I could do is to think through what are the impediments for our engineers to be wildly successful? What were the impediments to that? Well, the impediments would be that the engineers, we did a study of, uh, we're very data oriented. We did a study of our successful engineers and engineering managers and those who were less successful, not losers, just not good. And it was based on their promotions and the amount of pay that they got and the ratings that they had. And then we mapped that against their informal networks. And we, uh, by this time, did have good email systems, and so we were able to track through our email th the natural networks. Can you picture what I'm talking about? Like who's, e who's emailing whom and so on, uh, irregardless of what jobs they had or what organizations we had. And we found that those people that had the broadest uh, network were the most successful, all right? So we can teach people now, engineers, effective networking skills the importance of networking, that just because you're a brilliant engineer doesn't mean you shouldn't work with a quality control clerk who's important to you because they can stop you in the tracks and that you do so just naturally. That would be one. Another is what gets in the way of effective engineering is, uh, uh, is making sure that you don't design defects in and that you can understand where all the defects could come from and you make sure your designs are robust enough that they can't come in. There are tools for robust design that are probably not taught in undergraduate programs, but we can teach them. And so we brought in programs to teach them that. So it, would, it wasn't how do I make them, how do I get to, into the technology, how do I make them more successful? I and mean, that's what drove me. And by the way, once they see that, then they take off with it because what do we know about engineers? 
<laughs> among all of their wonderful traits, they are smart and they're data oriented. So if we can get them the data, get them to intellectualize this thing, they'll go. So that's how we did it. Yep, and I've seen it time and time again, a smart person who's willing to work really, really hard beats the um, really smart person every time. Yeah, absolutely yeah, right. It's a combination of just being nice and, uh, and working really hard. So Dan, I'll ask you a question I get all the time in office hours, um, and a lot of these folks are graduating um, in the next few weeks. Wow. What, should, what attributes are, should they look for in their first job out of college? Just in general, what, what would you, if your right. children were coming to you now, what would you say to them, other than not back slapping them a little bit? Well, I guess there's sort of two answers. Yeah. I'll give you the answer of a father, which I'm not yours, but it's okay, and then of the big corporate kind of guy. <laughs> the father says, just get a job. <laughs> now, you know, the first job I got, I just got a job, because I needed a job. And you know, I learned from that crappy job. So the father would say, just get a job. Right. Okay. The higher level thing would say, uh, you want a place that's open to educating you, to helping you, to exposing you to, to complexity and to operations. If you're in a place that says, look, you're, gonna, you're, you're, uh, you're technically trained and you're gonna start as a technician, that's just, so you're gonna learn that, and you do a good job there, we'll make you an engineer one. If you do a good job there, an engineer two, a good job there, engineer three, forget it. Now, that would just drive me insane, I couldn't go work for a place like that. It's a place that's open to a whole wide variety of challenges for you where you can go in different ways because you don't yet know what you want to do. I, look, if you're getting a PhD in material science, you know, you pretty well know, right? Uh, but I, I'm talking you know, for sure the, the undergraduates, you don't really know wh what you want. So go to a place that's open for learning, open for taking chances, has a track record of moving people around. Because if, if your aspirations are high, uh, in the management or in the leadership side of things. You need to develop muscles. You have to have a breadth. You have to have a variety of experiences because you're gonna run into problems that if you've only been in a narrow place where you weren't open to learning, where your company wasn't open to teaching, you're not gonna know how to deal with those complex situations. The only way that happens is facing complexity. So join a company like that. Yeah, definitely there's a time to learn and a time to earn. You guys are gonna be going into the time to learn phase right out of college. Uh, don't take the job that's the highest, pr uh, highest pay, take the one where you're going to learn the most and it's going to be a healthy environment for you. Um, Patrick, do you, you have a question? I'll give you a chance to field yours. Okay. So, uh, Dan, you know, at the uh, technology management program here, a lot of the focus is on uh, entrepreneurship. Um, you are someone who's worked for big companies, you've had a lot of success earlier in your career. I think a lot of the students here will also find themselves in large companies. Kind of further to the last question then, what sort of advice would you give students once they're in a job? What sort of things can they do um, to, to uh, move into those leadership roles and uh, really extend themselves? Uh, well, you know, first thing is to get that first job done really, really well. Show that you've got fortitude, that you've got ambition, that you're willing to work hard and and, and getting that job done. But really the next thing is to seek out a job that's related to what you do, but it's not exactly what you do. To see how well you can do in moving outside of your comfort zone. Bosses, companies that are successful want to see that, they need to see it. And it's amazing how quickly you can develop the self-confidence that is, after all, the core to success. If you don't have self-confidence, it's gonna be very, very hard to be successful. And the only way you can develop self-confidence is to deal with things that you weren't prepared to deal with. I mean, how do you develop self-confidence if you just continue moving up this micrometer? Uh, you develop by getting to situations that you're not fully prepared for, but somehow you handle. And you do that by taking chances. Well, Dan, I can't thank you enough. This has been fantastic. Thanks for all the questions from the audience. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Christmas. Yeah. Maybe some Christmas Oh gifts my, you see Santa Barbara a month. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.